Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we are talking about Chapter 12, Lesson 1, Describing Earth's Atmosphere. Uh, it's a new chapter, new unit, in fact, on the atmosphere, weather, climate, and things of that nature. Let's go ahead and get started. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer the following questions. How did Earth's atmosphere form? What is Earth's atmosphere made of? What are the layers of the atmosphere? And how do air pressure and temperature change as altitude increases? Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before we actually get into Earth's atmosphere, let's talk about atmospheres of the other bodies orbiting the solar system. Uh, scientists have determined that all eight planets, including Earth, uh, have an atmosphere. Mercury has a very tiny one. Venus has a thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide and uh, sulfur dioxide. Mars has a thin atmosphere of car mainly carbon dioxide. The gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all have the same atmosphere, though varying in uh, densities of uh, hydrogen and helium. However, these gas giants all have moons uh, in one way or another that actually have atmospheres. For example, Io, the only place on the solar system uh, beside Earth that we see active volcanic activity, has a sulfuric dioxide also in its atmosphere and also traces of salt uh, there. Uh, Europa has a, uh, another moon of Jupiter, has a thin atmosphere of oxygen. Saturn has Titan, which has the thickest atmosphere outside of the planets. Uh, it has mainly a nitrogen atmosphere, also methane and oxygen. And scientists are planning on sending space probes to look over there to see about if there are building blocks of life there. Uh, Neptune has Triton. Uh, its main moon has a mainly nitrogen atmosphere, also with methane and carbon dioxide. But because it's too far away from the sun, we seriously doubt there might be building blocks of life. But Earth... Earth is primarily the first atmosphere we recognize. I mean, after all, we are breathing. So the atmosphere is a thin layer of gases surrounding Earth. If you look at this picture right here, okay, this is this is the Earth's atmosphere, and by the time you get a bit further up, you see the atmosphere is pretty much gone. Earth's atmosphere is actually very thin in relation to the uh, planet. It's about half the uh, altitude at the poles as it is as the equator. Uh, and it is hundreds of kilometers high. But in fact, for our purposes of uh, aerospace engineering and stuff, we consider space to be 100 kilometers on up, which we'll get to later. Earth's atmosphere contains a layer of insulation that helps keep temperatures on Earth within a range that living organisms can survive. Without uh, the atmosphere, the Earth would be a bit like the Moon or Mercury. Really, really hot when the Sun's facing it. Really, really cold when it isn't. Uh, because uh, all the heat would radiate away. So the atmosphere keeps the gases and ke the gases keep the heat in, keeping it nice and toasty and cool, depending on where you're at on the planet and whenever there is a season. Now, Earth's atmosphere helps protect living organisms from some of the sun's harmful rays, especially ultraviolet radiation and other forms of radiation from there. Now, because the atmosphere consists of molecules bouncing into each other, and especially because they're real thick, uh, running around in the atmosphere does create friction, especially at high speeds. And friction within the atmosphere causes most meteors to actually burn up before striking the Earth. Uh, so the atmosphere protects life on Earth in that way. But occasionally something really big will fly around and be too big for the uh, atmosphere to burn up, and then something will land and hit Earth. So, how did Earth's atmosphere form? Well, Earth's ancient atmosphere formed from hot gases that escaped from Earth's hardening surface, mainly carbon dioxide and things like that. Earth's ancient atmosphere also created had a lot of water vapor well, with a little bit of carbon dioxide. And, of course, uh, water vapor is simply water in its gaseous state. Uh, normally, when water is boiling at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, uh, water will be in gaseous form, but also temperatures lower because a liquid has a higher state of motion in the molecules. You'll have individual molecules uh, floating around in gaseous form, and so that's what really water vapor is. Now, from there, as Earth's atmosphere cooled, the water vapor condensed into liquid water that fell as rain, and over thousands of years, the rain fell and, of course, formed Earth's oceans. Now, what also was falling with the rain was actually dissolved carbon dioxide uh, because a lot of that was dropping, was initially tossed into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolved in rainwater and fell into the oceans, giving it a higher carbon dioxide content. 
In addition, what really brought oxygen to the fore was organisms that use photosynthesis because oxygen is a byproduct. It takes in carbon dioxide and spit out plain old oxygen. That's how the bulk of oxygen came in our atmosphere, and that's how oxygen is replenished in the atmosphere through plants and photosynthesis. Now, what exactly is Earth's uh, atmosphere made up of? Now, you might think that it's made up of oxygen. Whenever we say, what do we breathe? Well, we breathe in oxygen. Actually, not quite. That's not quite the case. Actually, nitrogen is the primary uh, element in Earth's atmosphere. Makes up 78% of the Earth's atmosphere. The reason uh, being is that nitrogen is an inert gas uh, because oxygen makes up about 21, which 78 and 21 makes 99%. So 99% of Earth's atmosphere consists of nitrogen or oxygen. If we had too much oxygen, fires, which consume oxygen as they burn, the chemical reaction, you'd light a fire and you wouldn't be able to put it out. That's why uh, liquid oxygen and things like that are so dangerous around open flames because oxygen is consumed quickly in a fire. So nitrogen helps keep you know the planet from bursting into flames instantly and things like that. Uh, now, the amounts of atmospheric gases, which include water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone, vary and make up the other 1%. And what else floating around also will be solid particles like ash and stuff from volcanoes and things of that nature in the atmosphere. So, let's look at the composition of Earth's atmosphere in this pie chart. Uh, nitrogen, in the form of N2, makes up 78% of the uh, at air in the atmosphere. Oxygen in o form of O2 makes 21%. Uh, argon, another inert element, makes up about 1%, 0.09, 0.9%, uh, and the remainder is all other elements including carbon dioxide that makes up that last tenth of a percent, including things like ozone, which is a uh, form of oxygen, O3, uh, which we'll talk about later, things like radon and, and water vapor and everything else are in there. So the bulk of what we breathe in and out is nitrogen, but our body doesn't use it in cellular respiration, and neither does uh, plants in photosynthesis. So keep this in mind. Nitrogen's about 78%, oxygen 21 everything else makes up about the remaining 1%. Now, so that's what the atmosphere is made up of. But what are the layers? There's actually five different layers, which we'll talk about. Uh, and here they are. Well, there's four of them. The fifth one is the exosphere, which is way up here. Uh, and this is a relationship of altitude and temperature, which we'll get into more detail. Uh, and the f closest layer, the layer that we live in, is what we call the troposphere. Okay, The troposphere is the lowest. It's from the surface to about 30,000 feet in the air. Uh, it's the warmest part, uh, you know, more or less, uh, if you will, uh, that we would feel. The warmest part of the troposphere is near Earth's surface. And this is where weather and everything look like. And this is from a really cool graphic. It's about 15,000 pixels in height. Uh, the troposphere is from the surface to about uh, 20 kilometers at the equator, 7 kilometers at the poles. Almost all weather occurs in this layer. For example, see Mount Everest way up here, uh, the jet streams. Uh, Clouds at sea levels, one atmosphere, uh, the tallest building in the world. Above this line is the death zone. Air contains insufficient oxygen to support human life. So when climbers climb up on Mount Everest, they have to pack their own oxygen because it's too thin. Okay, and so from there we have what's called the tropopause, which is the uh, which is the line that blurs between the troposphere and the next set, next part of the atmosphere, which is known as the stratosphere. It is the layer directly above the troposphere. And the area of the stratosphere that has a great amount of ozone gas is what we call the ozone layer, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, the stratosphere uh, goes up from the tropopause up to about 50 kilometers, and temperature increases with height. Uh, the space shuttle in the stratosphere would lose its... Uh, would lose its rocket boosters at that area, and so the temperature uh, going up to about 50 kilometers uh, slowly increases uh, to about 5 degrees, 5 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 15 Celsius. Okay, so uh, the next, uh, we're talking about the ozone layer. Uh, the ozone layer blocks ultraviolet rays or UV rays. You might have heard about that. They can cause skin cancer and things like that. And that's why when you go out, you put on sunscreen. I personally use SPF 70 because I'm such a pasty white scientist uh, to keep myself from getting uh, a nice toasty red scientist. But ultraviolet rays can kill plants and animals or absorb more effectively by ozone than by oxygen gas. So that's how the ozone layer helps keep life uh, on Earth. Now, 
combines, we talk about the next two layers kind of interchangeably in some ways, the mesosphere and the thermosphere are the layers of the atmosphere that are much broader than the trophosphere and the stratosphere. They have a lower density of gases. In other words, there's less molecules bouncing into each other uh, the higher up you go. Okay, so the higher up you go in altitude, con there's a pretty much a constant drop in uh, atmospheric density or molecules bouncing around each other. So let's talk about the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Uh, that's these right here, uh, the rainier on this graph, and we'll talk about this line in a second. But uh, in the mesos mesosphere, uh, which goes up from about 50 kilometers to 85 kilometers, temperature decreases with the height. Back in 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia broke up the mesosphere. Uh, Transluminous events, uh, this is electrical discharge during thunderstorms close up that. And in addition, uh, noctilescent clouds are the highest type of clouds. You very, very rarely see them. Uh, they're only seen in certain twilight conditions, and the sunlight bounces off of them over the horizon. And so the boundary between the mesosphere and the thermosphere is the mesopause, which is the coldest place on Earth, okay, way over here. So uh, a couple hundred degrees below zero, more or less. It's about mm, about 200 Kelvin, uh, which is really, really cold, okay. And so that's in the mesosphere. And at 100 kilometers into the th uh, thermosphere, we have what's called the Kármán line, which is the edge of space, okay kind of doesn't make sense that we're talking about a layer of the atmosphere and we talk about space. But here's why the Kármán line is considered by us aerospace engineers to be the uh, the edge of space. is because above this line, an aircraft would have to fly faster than the orbital velocity to generate enough lift to stay aloft. Because it's, the air is so thin, you need oxygen uh, and differences in pressure in order to generate lift. And the higher up you go, the faster you have to go to generate lift. And at about 100, 100 kilometers, you have to fly faster than the Earth's actually spinning in order to generate enough lift. So at that point, they say, you know what, it, it's space. Okay. And so let's go ahead and let's talk about uh, the ionosphere for a second, which we'll get into which we'll get into right here. Uh, the ionosphere is a region within the mesosphere and troposphere that contains ions. Display the color lights called auroras occur here, the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, the aurora australis in the southern hemisphere, the northern lights. Okay, The ionosphere is from about 60 to 300 kilometers in altitude. It contains ionized uh, molecules, and they're ionized by radiation from the sun. Radio waves, scientists figured out uh, shortly after radio, radio waves were discovered and radio was invented, that you could actually bounce radio waves off of the ionosphere. And if you bounce them off the ionosphere, you get really long range with the radio. Now, when I was little, uh, it was before the age of the internet, okay, uh, so one of the cool things you could do with a radio is if you would get on AM radio, and you can still do this, uh, if you go out late at night and turn on your AM radio, uh, you suddenly get uh, radio stations from way beyond from where you would uh, normally expect it, uh, especially here in South Louisiana. No, normally you could catch Baton Rouge, AM, occasionally you'll catch uh, WWL in New Orleans, and uh, you couldn't catch anything in Houston or anything like that. However, at night, when there's not a lot of solar radiation going around bouncing out things, powerful radio transmitters could bounce radio signals off the ionosphere, and you could suddenly catch radio stations from a long way away. Uh, I spent many a night as a young teenager listening to St. Louis Blues hockey games on KMOX out of St. Louis. So from Missouri to South Louisiana, I was able to catch a very good signal from KMOX at night. I also caught uh, New Mexico, northern Texas, things like that. And in fact, whenever I went to eastern Tennessee one time, I was catching KDKA, which is the first radio station in the United States, uh, airing a Pittsburgh Penguins hockey game. So from, you know, southeastern Tennessee all the way up to Pennsylvania. And it's under this idea that shortwave radios bounce uh, signals even further, which allow you to listen to radio from around the world. People around the world listen to the BBC World Service on their uh, shortwave radios, and that's from... Uh, that's being cast out in London and in uh, other places, and it allows you to listen to uh, the voice of England from all around the world. And the BBC isn't the only other ones. There's radio, there's Radio Netherlands, uh, Voice of Freedom in America, things like that. So, finally, let's talk about the thermosphere and things like that. Uh, the thermosphere is from about 85 kilometers to 690 kilometers. Density decreases as you go outward, usually the exosphere. Uh, 
is at about 500 kilometers, uh, which is what we tend to call outer space. And actually, the thermosphere uh, is where the International Space Station sits at. But it is, for all intents and purposes, uh, no oxygen. You can't breathe. They need spacesuits and things like that because the density is so thin. Okay, now. In the exosphere, like I just said, gas molecules really strike one another, and after about 650 kilometers, there is no, there's just completely outer space, hard vacuum, things like that. Now, let's start wrapping things up. Let's talk about air pressure and altitude. Okay, gravity is the force uh, that keeps pretty much everything on Earth, keeps Earth together, keeps us together. Gravity pulls gas particles in the atmosphere toward Earth's surface. As a result, air pressure is greatest near Earth's surface because all of the molecules in the atmosphere push downward on the lowest layer of Earth. Okay, so we're standing, especially in South Louisiana, we're only a couple feet above sea level, we're standing, you know, pushing down on top of us is 650 kilometers of air, uh, more or less. But because the, uh, the air pressure is greatest, but we're used to it, whereas you know, at higher altitudes, it's much less. And because of that, if you ever notice a box of something baking, they'll have high altitude directions. And that's because the air pressure is much less at higher altitudes, like 8,000 feet plus. It requires different cooking times in order to take this into effect. And so if we look at this right here, the atmospheric, atmospheric pressure versus altitude, okay, this is in... Uh, uh, this is in metric units of uh, kilopascals or the uh, uh, kilobars, rather. Okay, so we got 100 kilobars at uh, zero uh, feet above sea level. And by the time we get to 10,000 meters, it's dropped all the way down below uh, 30 uh, kilobars. And so that keeps on going down, down, down until you get nothing in the exosphere. So let's talk about the temperature and altitude. Now, you would think that the higher up you get, the colder it gets. But actually, things kind of change. Uh, in the troposphere, the temperature decreases as altitude increases. So the higher up you go in the troposphere, the colder it gets. So it's really cold on Mount Everest and things like that. However, by the time you get up to the stratosphere, the opposite happens, okay? So uh, we go up to the troposphere, it gets real cold. Suddenly you get in the stratosphere and it starts getting real warm the higher up you go. Uh, this is because of the increase in radiation and things like that. By the time you get to the mesosphere, the temperature starts dropping again because of a huge decrease in uh, atmospheric pr uh, pressure. And at the mesosphere, the mesopause is actually the coldest Earth's atmosphere gets. And then finally, in the thermosphere and exosphere, the opposite happens. It gets warmer. Uh, temperatures get really warm in the thermosphere. However, because of the lack of density, uh, you actually, if you were able to, like, stick your arm out in the thermosphere and things like that, I mean, your blood would boil and you'd, like, pretty much die within, you know, not too long a time. You actually, in those fleeting seconds before you past uh, this physical world to the great beyond, you actually wouldn't feel any heat uh, because the air molecules are so thin and the density is so low, very few air molecules bounce into you for you to see how warm it is. So let's wrap this up. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you would have been able to answer the following questions. How did Earth's atmosphere form? Well, it formed through gases released from the Earth's surface being trapped by gravity. In addition, oxygen was released through plants and photosynthesis. Now, what is the atmosphere of the Earth made of? Well, Earth's atmosphere is primarily made of nitrogen, 78%, and oxygen, 21%, with various gases, carbon dioxide, water vapor, argon, things like that, making up the rest. Okay, so what is the Earth's atmosphere in terms of layers? Well, there's really five layers. At the bottom is the trophosphere. Above, that's the stratosphere. Then the mesosphere, meso meaning middle. Thermosphere, meaning heat, because it's the hottest, which we'll talk about in a second. And exosphere, meaning outside. So troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere. Now, how do air pressure and temperature change as altitude increases? Air pressure decreases with altitude, but temperature decreases through the troposphere, and then it goes backwards. It starts increasing through the stratosphere. Once it gets to the mesosphere, it gets really cold where it gets coldest. Then whenever you get into the thermosphere, it gets really warm, and whenever you get out in space, you go from that. So that's it for this lesson. Always, any questions, comments, things like that, feel, please feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next time.